Hacemos la presencia de autoridades del Ministerio de Educación y Cultura que han concurrido, autoridades de diversas instituciones educativas, amigas educativas y de investigación, autoridades de instituciones educativas militares, a autoridades de la Asociación de Universidades del Grupo Montevideo, del Instituto Nacional de Evaluación Educativa, de la Asociación Uruguaya de Educación Católica, también de la Comisión de Acreditación, de la Embajada de los Estados Unidos, eh, autoridades del LATU también, así como autoridades de los diferentes componentes de nuestro sistema de educación universitaria, colegas y amigos, por supuesto profesores de esta casa. Esta tarde contamos con la presencia del experto estadounidense, doctor Leslie Diffink, gracias al apoyo de la Embajada de los Estados Unidos de América en el Uruguay y de las universidades ORT de la empresa de Montevideo y Tecnológica del Uruguay. El doctor Fink es un reconocido experto a nivel internacional en la enseñanza universitaria y la formación del profesorado. Después de recibir su doctorado de la Universidad de Chicago en 1976, ingresó como profesor en la Universidad de Oklahoma. En 1979 fundó en esa universidad el Programa de Desarrollo de la Enseñanza y fue su director hasta su retiro en mayo de 2005. De 2004 a 2005 fue el presidente de la principal organización profesional de profesores universitarios de los Estados Unidos. En la actualidad trabaja como consultor en la educación superior. Es autor del libro Creación de experiencias de aprendizaje significativas, un enfoque integrado para diseño de cursos universitarios y coautor del libro Aprendizaje basado en equipo el uso transformador de grupos pequeños en la enseñanza universitaria. Le damos ahora la palabra a nuestro invitado, el doctor Fink. Thank you, doctor, for that, uh, those kind comments. And thank you to the audience for taking time out on a warm afternoon to sit in a large, warm hall to hear somebody uh, make some comments about uh, higher education and teaching and learning. Uh, uh, I want to warn you, uh, this is the world premiere of this presentation. For Uruguay, only, not for right here, okay? That's good news because you are very important, you're the first ones to hear it. It also means it's the first time I've ever done it, okay? Uh, the ideas I know about, but if I, I'll have to see how my timing is going. I'm going to try to uh, share some ideas, but then leave some times for questions at the end, and we'll uh, try to see how that goes. But I'm, I'm not sure about the time, but we'll, we'll watch for that. Let me tell you a little bit about this topic, learning-centered higher education. Uh, one of the things that has become quite clear in the last two decades of higher education in the world is that there's a major paradigm shift occurring. That is a, I say major because it's like, if you remember the history of science, uh, Ptolemy, who had this conception of the universe where all the solar system revolved around the Earth. And then several years later, Copernicus came along and says, not so, uh, the sun is at the center. And it rechanged everything. And, and lots of resistance, lots of pushback, especially, I'm sorry, but from the Catholic Church till later, but that finally got resolved. But what's happening in, in higher education is that significant. It's that big a change, the reason I want to draw that analogy. And we are still learning what some of the implications are. But what I'm going to do in this presentation for you is identify a, and what's new about it for me is a big scope. I'm trying to lay out the big picture of what professors need to do, what students need to do, and what the administrators, the leaders of the universities need to do if we want to make our universities more learning centered. And I'm going to uh, try to lay out the reasons for doing that. Now, let me uh, give you a couple uh, underlying assumptions that are mine, okay? 
because if you accept, if these make sense to you, then the ideas that I lay out will make sense. If they don't, if these are not acceptable to you, you probably have some problems with these ideas. The first is, my belief is that all universities need to be learning-centered. This really is the better perspective. It's going to be, it results in better learning for students, and that's the big reason I think we need to take it. But that's my belief, and everybody accepts that, but that is one of my beliefs. The other is, I think all universities should change their goal from being a good university, okay? And I'm going to make this statement. I should say the goal of a university is not to be a good university. Now let me let that sink in. I'm obviously saying that for shock value, okay? We want to be a good university, of course. But I think the more important goal is that our universities need to focus on and make the effort to be a better university three years, five years, ten years from now than we are now. Okay? So we need to get ourselves on a growth curve. If we do that, the good university will take care of itself. But the real goal is not to be good, that's static. The real goal is to be better and that's more dynamic. Okay. Now here's my way of illustrating what that last statement means. All institutions, when they start, get better fairly rapidly, but then they level off. They get better little by little, but not rapidly. And then they come to now, whatever the now is, whenever it is, and always eternal now. And the quality of the educational program at the university has an option. One option is they continue on the line they're at now. Get better, but slowly, slowly. A better option is to get better rapidly, okay? And that's what I think all universities need to strive for. And then ask themselves, if we want to be on the A curve, what has to happen for us to do that? And I'm going to try to answer that now in the next uh, several minutes here. Okay, in the United States, this paradigm shift got started with this famous article, one of the most famous articles published in the United States about higher education. It was published in a magazine called Change Magazine in 1995. It became one of the most requested articles for reprints that that magazine has ever had. It's called the Bar and Tag article. And they basically said we're moving to, we have moved to a new paradigm. I thought they were optimistic. I said, we are starting to move to a new university uh, paradigm, but we're not there yet. And I think that part is true. But that's the article to dinner. Now, basically what they were saying is we need to shift from the old paradigm, which they said is focused on teaching, to a new paradigm, which is focused on learning. Now, the first time I read that, I said, I don't understand what the significance this is. I don't say, we teach, we want students to learn, we hope they do, what's the difference? But after I thought about it a while, I realized what the difference was and that it's major. And that's what made me realize this is the, a big paradigm shift and an important one. The big thing it does is it changes the questions we ask as a teacher or as a university. And here's the difference that I see. Let me take it down to the teacher for the moment. If I'm a teacher and I'm operating under the teacher paradigm, and I get to the end of a course or the end of the year, and I ask myself, did I do a good job of teaching this year? And if I'm operating from the teacher paradigm, this is the way I will try to answer that. I will say, well, let's see, I taught, uh, did I do a good job? Well, if the answer, did I know a lot about my subject matter? And did I communicate it clearly and dynamically and with some enthusiasm? If the answer to those questions are yes, then I can say, according to the teaching paradigm, yes, I did a good job of teaching. I was knowledgeable, I communicated clearly and effectively. But if we shift to the learning paradigm, we come to the end of the year and we ask ourselves, did I do a good job? We will still ask those questions, but those are not the new important questions. The new important questions are, did the students learn something important well? The new bottom line is not the quality of our teaching, but the quality of student learning. 
The quality of teaching is still important, but now it's not the ultimate end, it's the means to the end. And the same thing is true at the university level. The curriculum, the teaching, the all that is the means to the important end, which is not the teaching, not the curriculum, but the quality of student learning. And that is a major shift. So what's the impact that this is having? When it first got started, it was mainly affecting a little bit at the teaching level. What started to happen now in the United States, but increasingly worldwide, is the accrediting agencies that go out and say, good university, bad university, the questions they are asking are learning-centered questions. What's the quality of student learning? Not just the quality of teaching. And I'm going to show you two of them, two professionally. Yeah, there, there are accrediting associations for a particular uh, faculty, there are ones for the whole university. For engineering, and they were one of their very first, at least in the United States, in what was it, the year 2000, they drew up new criteria for accreditation of an engineering program. They said, it's not just did you study the right courses, but did the students not only learn something, they said what the something should be. And they called it to the A to 12 abilities. All students, they want to see evidence students are learning that. They also want to see evidence that the courses and the curriculum are leading students to learn that. So they laid out the specifics of that. The Medical Association also has more recently, just in the last few years, laid out five general competencies that they think all medical schools should make sure that all graduates of medical schools achieve. And they got them under general headings there, like medical knowledge, patient care, system-based practice, so forth, so forth. Okay? And I'm very hopeful that those medical schools will be learn how to do an effective job on those, because right now they're not. I'm guessing in Uruguay, like in the United States, I go to many doctors, and a lot of them do not know how to interact effectively with their patients. They don't communicate effectively, they don't communicate with the nurses and the other staff. There's a lot of things that are not good. If they learn interpersonal skills, uh, professionalism, practice-based learning, etc., our doctors will be a lot better in the next five years, ten years than they are now, if we can implement that. Uh, some of you are probably familiar in Europe, more recently in the last, uh, what, three, four, five years, uh, the whole Bologna process has led the universities there to say, we want to see the desired competencies from your universities. That's, uh, that's learning center. They want to know, what do you want all students to do? Not just in this faculty or that faculty, the whole university, everybody should know certain things. What are those certain things? Okay. So this is starting to affect our crediting agencies and how our universities are operating and, and being approved and being rated. Now, we also, though, if we're going to focus on learning, we need to ask ourselves learning. We use that word all the time. Aprendice. What is it? Aprendizaje. Okay. Uh, does it just mean acquiring information and remembering it, understanding and remembering it? Well, that's part of it, but I don't think that's all of it. Is it knowledge plus attitudes plus competencies, ability to do things? That's part of it, but not all of it. Our beliefs, our concepts have a structure to them. Students need to understand that structure and the values that are associated with those structures. Are they learning how to do that? That's an important part of it. I'm going to try to combine all of those, and I'm going to say learning is really a new understanding of things. I'm just purposely leaving that a little bit vague, a little bit open, maybe all those bullets there. But understandings about the world, about other people, about yourself, how to interact with people, how society works, etc., that leads to growth, not just acquiring it static, but helps the person, the student, become a bigger person so that they can live more meaningful lives. Now, more meaningful lives, for me, unpacks in four ways. You can do it lots of different ways, and that's okay, but for me, there are four different kinds of meaningful lives. My personal life, some of the courses I took in higher education in the university were valuable to me, not because they helped me with my job, but because they helped me to read philosophy books and get meaning out of them. To go to a musical concert and understand what was happening. To go to an art museum and look at the pieces there. To read literature and understand what the meaning of that literature was because somebody taught me how to do it. That enhances my personal life. Sometimes we learn how to interact with other people, how to be a leader, how to, how to understand people who are different than me. Uh, that I call that social life. And the civic life is how to, I can engage in my society, political life, organizations in my community to try to make that community 
community better. Uh, and then finally, the one we're more familiar with, of course, is the professional life. But one way or another, we need to help students gain the new understandings that will lead to growth, that will enable and empower students to lead more meaningful lives. So that's what I, that's what I kind of broad meaning I give to learning. Now, one of the things that I has, have, be, have become known for, that's the reason I get some of these invitations, is in that book that, that I published about course design, I put together a new taxonomy of learning. Now, well, there's a, a very famous one in the United States, it's known to the United States and, and somewhat in Europe, called Bloom's Taxonomy. How many people here are familiar with Bloom's Taxonomy? Show of hands. Okay, uh, uh, some, a minority, but, but some of you. It was created in the 1950s, we're still using it widely. Uh, it's very famous and still very valuable, okay? But here's the difference between the Bloom Taxonomy and Fink's Taxonomy, okay? What Bloom did was interviewed professors and he asked them, what are the important things you really want your students to learn? Of course, he interviewed hundreds of people and had hundreds of different answers, but part of his genius was he was able to take all these hundreds of answers and, and collapse them down into six major categories, kinds of learning, the famous ones in the cognitive taxonomy. And they were uh, things like knowledge, they just they understand things, they remember it, uh, they know how to analyze it, and apply it, synthesize it, and evaluate it. Very important things. What was valuable in that taxonomy, it was prompted professors when they sat down and planned their courses to not just think of the memorization of the knowledge, but are they, can they apply it? Can they analyze it? Can they synthesize it? Can they evaluate it? They prompted them to think about some additional kind of learnings that once somebody asked it, they said, well, of course I would like that. So then they started doing things in their courses. My taxonomy has the same possible value, but here's the reason it's a different taxonomy than Bloom's. Bloom talked to professors. I talked to students. And I asked them this question. You've gone to the university. Have you ever had a course that you learned something from that changed the way you live your life? Personally, social, civic, professionally. And most of the students would say most of them didn't, but some of them did. And I'd say, okay, in those courses that did change the way you live your life, and that's what I mean by significant learning, something that's not just information in, information out, but something that changes the way you live your life. When that course had that effect, what kind of thing did you learn that allowed you, that allowed that course to have that impact on you? They gave me lots of different answers. My challenge was how to collapse that down into a manageable set. And this is my manageable set. Like Bloom, it has six major categories. Unlike Bloom, it's not hierarchical, it's interactive. And that's why I put it in this format. Let me just give you a quick tour around it. Starting at the top right, foundational knowledge. There are some things that students just need to know. Okay, in, 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 I don't want anybody uh, coming out of a world history class that doesn't know what happened in 1492, or that the, in the United States uh, history that uh, when the Civil War was in the 1860s and, and not the 1960s or the 1760s. I want them to know that. Okay, and other more important things. If somebody says plate tectonics or revolution, I want them to know what those concepts mean. Just foundation, understand it and remember it. But most students didn't talk about that stuff. That's why, but most of them said it was when I learned how to use it that it became valuable to me. And I call that application. And I'm going to shift now, that's the, uh, I call that the electron view. I'm going to shift to the pie chart version because it gives some side cover. Sometimes application means skills, like uh, physical skills or how to operate a microscope or play the piano or something like that. More often it's talking about different kinds of thinking, critical thinking, creative thinking, practical thinking, where you solve problems, make decisions. All right? Or sometimes how to manage a project, how to break it, break it down into steps and sequence those steps in the right order and so something big happens. But how to do something. The integration is where students, it was in that course where I learned how to see the connection between geography and history and economics and politics. Or what happened in the 1800s with what happened in the 1900s, what happened in the year 2000, or, or what I'm learning in class in my personal life at home. Okay? We are making connections between all kinds of things. I call that integration. That part, that right-hand side of the taxonomy is very much like Bloom. That's the cognitive side. It's almost identical using some of the same labels. But once we move to the left-hand side, that's where we leave Bloom behind and introduce some new kinds of learning. A lot of the students said, I had a course that was valuable to me because in that course I learned something about myself. 
who I am, who I want to be, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at, etc., etc. They learned about themselves. Or they said, the course helped me learn how to interact with people, other people. People different from me, how to be, how to work effective in a small group, how to be a leader, how to make an organization change, learn how to interact with others. Those two are so closely linked that I put them in the same category and called that the human dimension. Other people said the course had a different impact. It helped me get excited about something I was not excited about before, ancient history, geography, uh, biology, or whatever. Or they said it made me rethink my values about certain things. One of my hopes in geography is I will help students see the value of environmental, uh, what, envir a sustainable environment, a green environment. Uh, in a course in biology, I might want students to see, or in, in the social science, the benefits of social diversity and, and, and good relations amongst different kinds of groups and, and diverse tolerance for different people. Those are rethinking values. And last, and definitely not least, some students said a course was valuable, not just because of what I learned in the course, but the course taught me how to learn more about that subject after the course was over. I learned how to learn. And then they had a life in front of them. They became uh, self lifelong learners, self-directing learners. Most people would see that as a very good thing, and I, I'm one of those. So that gives us a little bit of a guide to what kinds of important, significant kinds of learning that we might want to strive for in our courses, but also at the university level. Now, uh, here are some of the things that people have often written about that would be good if students could learn in higher education. But I want to show you how easily they fit into this taxonomy. Uh, when people have talked about conceptual knowledge, then conceptual understanding, that fits in the foundational knowledge. But more important, look at all the different things that show up in application. And integration, interdisciplinary learning, is that a big thing in Uruguay? It's right out of the integration category. Uh, learning communities, connections between what I'm learning in university and different parts of my life. Uh, human dimension, caring and valuing, and especially how to keep on learning. Okay. So those are what this taxonomy offers for universities is a possibility for thinking more broadly what you might want to set as a goal for all your students to learn while they're in your care taking courses at your university. Now, the question for today is, if we want to be a learning-centered university and set up some important kinds of learning that will really have an impact on students' lives, whether you use my taxonomy or Bloom's or your own ideas, either one's okay. That's not important. The important thing is if you want to set up good learning, how do you get that to happen? Regularly, consistently, all across the university, not just in the courses of some of the really good professors. And here's the framework that I'm going to use for today. Uh, one part of what has to change is Los Profesores, okay? So I'm going to talk quite a bit about that. Los Estudiantes, they're a big part of the picture. They have to change too. And then finally, those interactions there, but then finally, the leaders of the university. There are some things they have to do to support the professors, the estudiantes, and their interactions and so forth. So I'm going to talk about each of those three parts there. And you should have a, an outline with your handout you came in. Uh, I've, I'm going to talk about a lot of different things because there's subpoints under each of these units here. So I want to give you a place to write some notes, and that's what that's for here. Okay. Most professors. What can they do to get more, better kinds of learning to happen? Okay. Well, here's my diagram of what any teacher does when they teach. Good teacher, bad teacher, doesn't matter. If you teach, you have to engage in these four activities. Starting at the top left. Every professor has to know something about the subject matter they're teaching. My background was in geography. I had to know something about geography before I tried to teach others. But then if we drop down to the designing learning experiences, and that's going to be the workshop I'm giving tomorrow, but what I mean there is all the decisions we make before a course begins about what we want to have happen in that course. What do we want to have them read? Textbook? 
articles from journals, articles from lots of journals, different textbooks, things off the internet, uh, things that I write, PowerPoints I show them, lots of different sorts of information. Uh, how are we going to assess the student learning? One midterm and a final, uh, weekly quizzes, uh, lots of different projects. Are we going to have work in groups uh, or not? Are we going to assess the work of groups? Is that going to count as part of the course grade? So forth, so forth, so forth, okay? Uh, so lots of different decisions we have to make, and that's what I mean by the course design process. Most of that happens before the course begins. Once the course begins, then the other two tasks begin, and the big one is the one at the top. We interact with students in lots of different ways. When you're lecturing like I'm doing right now, that's one kind of interaction. You lead a whole group discussion. You lead small group discussions. You meet with your students one-on-one -on -one in your office. You email them back and forth. You visit with them in the cafeteria when you're walking across campus. All the different ways we communicate with students, I'm calling that interaction. And then finally, we manage the course. Keep track of data, who's enrolled, who's not, who took a test, who didn't, which one counts. They turn in some papers, keep track of the things and, and not lose them before we grade them and get them back. Now, here's the premise of a couple, couple observations about that. Most professors ha have enough knowledge of the subject matter to teach well. You don't get to be a college professor without going through school, graduate school, or going through some professional experiences preparing for that. We need to learn more, but that's not a limitation to better teaching. Most people manage the course well. I've seen some that didn't, but most do, the vast majority. The two big variables, professors vary a lot in how well they interact with students, but that's kind of a 50-50 curve. Half of them do a pretty good job, half of them don't. Designing the learning experience, there's variation, but it's not 50-50. It's heavily skewed to the negative side. Most professors do not do a good job of designing the courses, not because they're dumb, not because they're badly intentioned. Nobody has ever taught them how to do it. And that's the reason I, I work so hard to put my book together, because I say, if we can solve that piece, it's going to improve the whole thing for a lot of people. And that sort of seems what it's done. Okay? But big variables, interacting with students and designing the course, those are two big things that professors have to learn about because if they can learn about them, their students will learn better. And that's a, that's a key point. Okay, so let's look at those two. Uh, they have to learn about how to design the courses, how to read and for students. Let me give you a quick preview of what's going to be happening in the workshop tomorrow, but even if you don't come to that, this will be a preview of what course design, learning centered course design looks like. First thing you have to realize that compared to now, most, most courses now are designed in a topic-centered, subject-centered way, not learning-centered. Like, for example, when I taught world geography, and if I'm going to design that course in the teaching-centered way, topic-centered way, I'll do it like this. Well, let's see. I'm teaching world regions. Uh, what are the main regions of the world? Well, there's North America, South America, Europe, Middle East, Africa, Asia, and so forth. If I change to a learning-centered way, I've got, I can't, and, and that leads to nouns, North America, South America, or if you're in history, you know, 18th century, 19th century, 20th century, whatever, uh, other topics, other, you know, other courses, other topics. But the focus is going to be on topics and nouns. Okay? When you shift to a learning-centered, you shift to learning outcomes, and here's what your question is when you start to plan the course. My hope is that by the end of this course, all students will, and then you finish the sentence, but the next word has to be a verb. I want them to think critically, learn how to solve problems, learn how to rethink their values, learn how to work with others in small groups, whatever. There are going to be a series of verbs. And that's going to be the learning outcome that you want for your, and that's just, that's the, and that's a verb, okay? So we're shifting from nouns to verbs, and that's a challenge. That's difficult for professors. All their life, they've thought about topic, topic, topic. When you think to verbs, you have to plan your course differently. And here's the big outline. You start with learning outcomes, and like I said, I want them to learn to think, solve problems, uh, make decisions, analyze geographic interactions, or whatever. But then I have to say, two other circles, what would they have to do to learn to do that? That's the learning activities. And second, what would they have to do to prove to me that they had learned how to do that? And that's the assessment activities. And they must be connected to the learning outcomes, not just some kind of assessment, not just some kind of activity. They have to be activities that are focused on those learning outcomes. Now, how, one thing that helps us do that, well, let's see here, okay, uh, back up here. How do I, let me skip over some, this is how to write some of those learning outcomes, but let's save that for tomorrow. 
Let me show you, though, one example of a, uh, a course in accounting. This was a lady that was teaching an integrative course. It was legal issues in accounting, so it had law and accounting kind of mixed together. Here was her learning outcomes. Now, of course, in this course, students will be able to recognize and understand legal terminology. These were business majors, not law students she was working with, so they had to learn that new language. Application. Compare and contrast opposing legal principles, then choose a position and defend it. Identify the relationship between the needs for legal integrity and accounting. You have to do both, good, good law, good accounting. See themselves as confident and competent accountants. Work with others as a member of a team. Good thing for accountants to learn how to do. Many don't. Want to be a good legal and ethical in their accounting work? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. And finally, know how to continue because there are going to be new court cases that come out, uh, new laws about accounting. Learn how to deal with these new things when they come out. In other words, keep on learning. Now that's a pretty exciting prospect to think. Is it really possible to get all of those to happen in one course? And the short answer is yes, and she proved it. It was a she. She had a course, evaluated students, and that all of those happened in one course. And that's pretty exciting. Way better than topic one, topic two, topic three. Okay, now we come back to those three key, key components, those three circles, and when you're planning the course, one very valuable tool for doing that is to take those three circles and lay them out in the columns of a table. You start by filling out your learning outcomes, the left-hand column, show you, then you work across and say, okay, if I want students to uh, analyze different legal positions in accounting and pick a choose and defend it, question, how would I know if they could do that? What would they have to do to prove to me they had learned how to do that at a good level? That's your, that's your assessment activity. And what you discover when you do that is you need different kinds of assessment activities for different kinds of learning. And this is what that might look like. For foundational knowledge, multiple tests are just fine. But you move to application, you might want test studies. Integration, you might want an essay. Human dimension, a reflective essay. Caring, a statement of preferences. And finally, a learning portfolio for showing that they know how to keep on learning. Similarly, uh, so oh yeah, yeah, let me share that with you. So that's a little, you know, let's go back to that. That's a little challenging, right? Because we haven't done much of that. We've done essays and multiple choice tests, but all focused on topics and cognitive knowledge. So we're going to have to learn and we have to imagine new ways of assessing student knowledge. One time I was running a workshop in, in a part of the United States that's right near a very poor section of the country called Appalachia. If you then know the United States over in the uh, Appalachian Mountains, eastern part of the country, people work in coal mines and get paid very little, they're very poor. Well, this university was in that part of the university, eastern Kentucky, and I was doing this workshop and this one lady taught English, okay, and that's kind of interesting. And uh, she said, I have a new kind of assessment that I've been trying and I like it and I think it fixed your taxonomy. And so we said, tell us about it. She said, well, one of her goals, she taught a, uh, an English class for freshman students, first year students, and one of her beliefs was that her students were too much centered on themselves. They didn't care about the welfare of other people. Now, in a Jesuit university, that would be a problem, right? Because you care about social justice and all that sort of thing. She wanted to make an impact on students' ability to care for people other than themselves. How did she assess whether she made an impact on that from the beginning of the course to the end of the course? I thought she had a very creative way. Here's what she did. First day of class, our students come in and talked about the course a little bit and said, now take a piece of paper. I'm going to ask you a question. This is not going to be graded, but I want you to write your answer and keep it. It says, imagine that you won, there's a thing called a lottery. Do you know what lotteries are? Uh, a chance where you buy a ticket and then maybe win a million dollars, okay? Well, they have a lottery in Kentucky. She says, imagine you won the Kentucky lottery and you won a million dollars. What's the first three things you would do with that money? Okay, so they write that down. What she reported was almost all of her first year students said, I'm going to build me a big new house. No, no, I'm going to, first thing, I'm going to buy me a big new car. I'm going to build me a big new house. Second. Third, I'm going to take me on a big vacation to Hawaii, Colorado, California, Florida, or whatever. Here we go. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Set that aside. She does some things with them through literature. I presume reading stories about people that did things for others or didn't do other things and so forth and so forth. Got to the end of the course. Take out a piece of paper. You won a million dollars. What's the first thing you'd do with that? What she reported was... The first thing was still a big new car, okay? 18-year-olds, Eastern Kentucky, couldn't get past a big new car. But after that, I'm going to build a big new house, not for me, but for mom and dad. Don't get choked up about it. 
When mom and dad have been living in a poor shack in Kentucky for their whole life, I want to give them a bigger house. Or I'm going to build a building for the youth in, in, in the city that are getting trouble because they don't have anything to do. Or I'm going to build a shelter for the women who are getting beat up by their husband and give them a safe place to go to. Or um, so forth, so forth. They did some things for the community. Now what was nice about that is it really reflected an honest change in value. Students could still say, big car, big house, big vacation for me. But, but there was, she could count it. How many said, me, me, me? How many said, mentioned other people? So she could count it. Second thing was, you don't have to worry about the reliability and all the statistics about it. She didn't need that because the grade didn't depend upon it. All she needed to know was, did I impact 10% of the class or 80% of the class? That's all I want to know. That tells me I, I made an impact, I didn't make an impact. So we're going to have to imagine some creative ways, some simple ways of getting at this new kind of learning that we might want. Okay. Next thing we have to do is carry those learning goals across the learning activities. What do students have to do so that they can learn to make these, act these different kinds of learnings? And again, we'll find out we have different kinds of learning activities for different kinds of learning goals. For foundational knowledge, read the book is just fine. Application, probably going to have to solve some problems in class. Integration, maybe have a discussion, maybe whole class, small group, private reflection, or whatever, and so on down to different things. We're going to have to learn how to do those things. But if we can do that, and then what we do is kind of work through this, this sequence here. We write our learning goals, we put them in the left-hand side of the three-column table, we work across identifying the assessment activities, learning activities, then we take those two act sets of activities and put them in a weekly schedule. What are we going to do week one, week two, week three, week four? And what we have to do is make sure we have all those activities in that schedule, because if we don't, we don't have the activities necessary to drive and create the kinds of learnings we say we want. But if we get them all in there and get them in the right sequence, what will happen is that exciting kind of learning that we imagined at the beginning, in fact, will turn out to be the kind of learning that's achieved by students. And that's what's starting to happen, is people learn how to design their courses in a learning-centered way and go through that systematic process. They're saying that the learning that those students achieve, not 100%, but at least 70%, 80%, are close to what the, the, the exciting things that they imagined as a teacher beforehand. Okay. Let me just show you one little case example of a professor who did that and show you what a difference it made when he designed his course in a learning-centered way. This was a professor teaching at a technical university in Missouri, and he was in uh, teaching a course on coding in computer science. This was about his third year of teaching. He took a workshop with me and, and learned how to design his course. But what he'd been doing up to, up to that time, he had about 18 students, just a Monday, Wednesday, Friday class, was what all the professors in engineering were doing, lecture, homework, lecture, homework. But in his case, it really wasn't working. Uh, at the first few weeks, things, things went all right, but after about week five or six, the students got overwhelmed with all the complexity of the math. They got frustrated. They gave up. They stopped trying. They didn't learn, and they hated the course. They hated him. Bad picture. Bad picture. He came to the workshop, learned how to redesign, went, and here's what he did. He wrote some new learning goals. I said rewrote, but that's not true. He didn't have learning goals before. He had topics. But now he's got learning goals. There's an example of three of them. He had all six of my taxonomy. The first one is application. The second one is human dimension. The third one is learning how to keep on learning. He used a new teaching strategy, the team-based learning, which uh, some professors here at the Catholic University have learned about, and using with good effect. I like it. I use it in my workshop. I'll use it tomorrow. Uh, he used that. Used reflective writing. Had students put together learning portfolios. Had them give oral presentations. Thought it would be nice for if engineers could uh, talk as well as compute. Okay. Interesting concept. Maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, had we submit their homework. So he changed those things. What happened? Well, even though he didn't lecture, you know this lecture was not in there. He didn't lecture. He had students read it and come in and do some things in class. Uh, but they still learned the foundational knowledge. But here was the big lesson. Remember how the students went downhill, downhill, downhill. What he said is after he made these changes, there was a drastic improvement in student morale. They worked harder all the way through the course and said they enjoyed it. Worked harder and enjoyed it more and learned more. Okay? Uh, here are a couple of students' comments. You can read those. Just basically testifying to what he was saying. And now let me ask you a question. If you can find a way to change your course so the students go from being unhappy with it to working harder, enjoying it more, and learn more, how do you think that makes you feel as a teacher? Here was his comment. 
just what you'd expect. It made his, it changed his life as a teacher. I mean, it flat out did. It just changed his life uh, because. Who of us like to look at students, half of them aren't there, the ones that are there aren't paying attention, or they're sitting there like, duh, duh, duh. You know, unengaged, no mental energy, no activity, no nothing, okay? We don't like that. If we can do things where we can look at students, they're excited, they're energized, they're working, and we find out they're learning well, our life is more satisfying as a teacher, and that's happening for these teachers as well. Okay, so that's one way to design our courses. Learn how to interact with our students in new ways. It was the United States wrote a book, uh, that book on the left, that's a cover of it, and the name of the book was uh, What the Best College Teachers Do. And he interviewed a lot of the university's teachers that were really, everybody said these were the best teachers in the whole university. And he came up with uh, some ideas about what we could do. Now, my definition, this is not Ken Bain's idea, is that what these teachers, in fact, did when they interacted with their students was they worked as effective leaders. Now, I studied leadership a few years ago. I didn't become the world's best leader, but I did come up with a good definition of leadership that I like. And that's this. A good leader is someone who motivates and enables two different things, others to do important things well. Now that's what I think we have to do as teachers. We have to motivate our students, the others are our students. Motivate them and enable them to learn, not nickel dime memorization stuff, but important things, and how to learn those things, not just learn them, but learn them well. Okay? If we can do interact with them in a way that does that, uh, we're going to be a good leader of our students. How, how do we, we have to do to lead students? And I think the key is we have to create the right kind of relationship, those of us who are teachers. Now, how do we create the right kind of relationship? Caring, respectful, collaborative. And here's what I, now this is where Bain feeds into this. I'm just feeding things into you from Bain here. He had four kinds of things. You have to show students you really care. Not just act like you care, you have to really care. Okay, but show it to students. Uh, second, you have to work with them in a way that motivates them, not unmotivates them. Have good communication skills. And finally, prove yourself as trustworthy when it comes to power of trust issues in the classroom. And they're always the rise, they're always there. Now, let me unpack that just a little bit. Uh, things you can do to show students you care. You have to care about them as human beings. Care about their learning, but also care about the teaching learning process, which means you learn new ideas about it, make an effort to be the best teacher you can, and get yourself on that growth curve, and that shows students you care. But you also have to care about the subject of the course. You have to be excited about it. When I teach geography, I have to be excited. I teach a course in college teaching, I got to get excited. You teach history, math, engineering, uh, economics, business, whatever, you have to care about the subject, you have to care about the students, and you have to make that visible to students. That shows them you care. Interact in a way that motivates. What those great teachers that Bain found is they gave away, they gave praise in a way that motivates. They didn't just say, well, good job, good job, no matter what you did. They had criteria, and they praised you when you met the criteria, but they also helped you say, you didn't quite measure up this time, but with a little more effort you probably can. Don't just say, good job, good job all the time. But that's the way that motivates. Thank you for letting me use your example here. Uh, you have to listen to the learners. Listen carefully to what their problems are. Uh, try to find out what's going on with them, with their learning, or their, in their personal life or social life that's creating a problem for them. Uh, and then motivate different people differently. Now this came a little bit out of ben, Ken Bain's book, but the other thing I've learned, I, I like sports a little bit, and I've read some books about good, great coaches. And what I found out, the great sports coaches have learned, all of them, how to motivate different players differently. I remember one basketball coach in the United States, the one at UCLA, John Wooden, if anybody followed that stuff, one of the, probably the best basketball coach ever in the United States, and he said he had, when he has teams, there'd be one player, if he wants to motivate that player, he's got to get up in his face and yell, John, I need Excuse me, sorry. No. But another person, if he, if I did that to her, she'd well. She'd, oh, yeah. yeah. So he, hey, come on, you can do a little bit better. I think give a little more effort. Is that okay? Yeah. And that will motivate her. That's all she needs. But I got to know what motivates you, and I got to know what motivates you, and not treat you both the same. But that's what the good people do: is figure out the difference among students and learn how to do that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, communication skills. Have a sense of drama, rhythm. These are language. language this is being promised things, not just you've got to do this, you've got to do this, but here's what can happen if you do do it. And this was the thing that was common to all the good teachers. 
They really believed in the core of their being. Every student in their class could learn if I can just figure out how to teach it right. They really believed that. They didn't write off a single student, can't do it, they can't do it. They said, oh, they can do it too if I can just figure out how. They just believed they had that faith in students and then worked to make it happen. Finally celebrate the achievements. Uh, trustworthy, that just means if you make a policy for one student, you've got to be fair and make that true for everybody. Okay? So don't make it a policy, don't do it for one student unless you're ready to do it for everybody. And, and secondly, if you, if you, well let's see, don't use it as a, a place to demonstrate power. Listen up, I'm the boss around here, don't tell me what to do, I'll tell you what to do. Uh, that's, the, that's the power structure here. Uh, but the other thing is build trust relationships. Uh, if you say you're going to do something, you got to do it. Say you're going to have, bring something to class, you're going to create something, you're going to provide a session on something, you've got to do it and follow through on it. And then give, help the students make their own decisions about things that they can. You do those things and they're going to, uh, you're going to interact with students in a way that's going to motivate them. Now, one other thing I've done, I'm not going to go over these a lot, but on your, uh, one other piece of paper with your, uh, the cover sheet on top of it here is, I think I mentioned in the last 25 years or so, since 1990, there have been lots of books with really good ideas on college level teaching that have come out. We didn't have these in the 70s and 80s, we have them now. Uh, but, I mean, it's like 50, 60, 70 ideas now, and I've got a list of them in chronological order. They're all good, but in my view, they're not all equally good. There's a few of them that I think are just major blockbuster ideas. And I gave you on that handout of these five high-impact teaching practices. These are things, course design is one of those, but there's some other things there, like small groups, team-based learning, some other thing. If you can learn some of these ideas and learn how to apply them, I can vouch from personal experience, because all of these ideas that are things that I learned about that I didn't have when I began teaching, I learned about them, and they made a huge difference in the quality and quantity of student learning in my classes. So those are ideas, I just offer those to you, but those are ideas you can learn about how to design your course, how to interact with students, and how to do other things in your class that I think can make a huge difference. But the fact that there are multiple ideas out there that you can learn about that will make a difference is going to have an implication for one of the other things I'm going to talk about here. And that is, if we want to be a teacher that gets ourselves on a growth curve, like I was talking about about the university, how are we going to do that personally? I think we have to help the professors spend time, we have to do it ourselves, but the university has to help the professors spend time learning new ideas about teaching and using them. Okay? Learning new ideas and using them. That means there's time not teaching, time not on research, just time on getting better professional development. That's what uh, that what makes a learning, and so the university has to provide that, and we'll talk about that with the uh, administrative part. But so this is a review of what teachers can do, the professors can do, to improve learning-centered uh, instruction and educational program at a university. But they're not the only important players, right? Who's the other important player? Who? They're students. They're the ones who do the learning. So if we're going to be a learning center, we've got to make sure they get on board. Students, all right? Uh, so now we've got, what can the students do to get uh, help us out here? What do they need to be doing? And what I think they need to be doing is stop being passive receivers of information. They've got to learn how to be good learners. So that's what I mean by meta-learning. I don't say metacognition. That's thinking about thinking. I'm talking about learning about learning, students learning about learning. And if they do that, if they can do that, they become meta-learners. People learn about learning, and after they learn about learning, they can become people who direct their own learning, take charge of it, take responsibility for it, do the things that they can figure out they need to do to learn this information, these ideas well. They have to do it. We don't do that. That's student work. Okay? Now, we can do <coughs> things to help them. Let me ask you this question. What is it our students doing now? I, I'm not going to name names, but I was just walking through some of the, the classrooms around this campus here and I was looking in on them. What did I see students doing? What would you guess? Sitting and listening, right? Maybe taking notes now and then. Okay? Here's my sense of most students says, what am I doing here at the university? Well, I gotta pass a course so I can get a job, get a degree so I can get a job, right? How do I pass the course? Well, I gotta go to class, take notes, try to remember it, pass the exam. If I do all of that, I'm a good student. 
We've got to change that view of what their responsibilities are. The problem is they're focused on passing tests, not on learning. We've got to change that and make them meta learners, people who respond, take responsibility for their own learning. How can we help them do that? Okay. Uh, well, that's just saying what I've always said. I'm going to show you some information from two people that I've learned about in the United States who I think are doing a fabulous job of helping students become meta learners. Uh, one is Sandra McGuire. I'm going to show you what she does. And then we've got a video animation by Stephen Car Carroll. What they're doing is different, but it's, they're both very powerful. She's using the concept of metacognition, and what she's trying to do is to prove to students. She works with, she teaches chemistry at a large state university, so she's got these large classes, teaches chemistry to first year students. And her belief is that they come in there with believing that their IQ, their intelligence, is fixed. I'm either smart or I'm dumb. I'm not sure which, but I'm afraid I might be dumb. I don't know if I'm qualified to be a college student. And they start taking their courses, and they take some tests, and what happens? The data they get tells them they're right. You are too dumb to be in college. Bad information, bad information. What she says, I've got to prove to the students that they can raise their intelligence, they can raise their IQ in one year. In fact, in 60 minutes, she can do that. She takes them out of her chemistry class and has a one hour session with the students about learning. One hour. In that 60 minutes, she proves to them that she can raise their intelligence, their IQ, by a lot. And then she shows them how to apply that to their studies. Now, do you really believe you can raise people's intelligence a lot in 60 minutes? I'm going to prove to you I can increase your intelligence in about five minutes. A lot. Now this is, I'm going to give you the same exercise she gives her students. So we'll see if it works. I've done this a few times. It's always in the United States. I can improve Americans a lot. I don't know about your grades. You might be smarter than those Americanos. Okay, Marte America. Let's try it. Uh, I have to change the view about children's change the way they study. Okay, how do we do that? You know the vowels in the language, right? A E I O U. Okay, you know what those are. I'm going to give you a list of words, and I want to see if you can count how many vowels there are in that list of words. You ready? How many? Here's the words. I'm going to give you 45 seconds. Count those words. Or count the vowels, not the words, the vowels. How many of them? How many of them? Yeah. Twenty seconds. Ten seconds. There'll be a test at the end. Three, two, one, zero. Now, once you take out a piece of paper, seriously, take out a piece of paper with a little blank bar on Here's what I want you to do. How many of those items on that list can you write down? I want you to write down all the items you can remember. This, this may not take very long. <laughs> huh? I, I changed the question, didn't I? Okay. But go ahead and write it down. This is part of the test here. I mean, it may be one or two or three, but write whatever you can, okay? It's probably, I'd say, it's probably won't take too long. I was in the audience when she did this with me. It didn't take me very long. I, okay. Now, anybody need more time? Okay. How many people could remember six or more of those items? How many could remember six or more? Nobody. Hey, hey, hey. How many people could remember four or five? How many people were about? You have a few. Raise them up so everybody can see. These are the smart people in the crowd. Okay. Uh, how many? Two or three? Okay, more. One or zero? Okay. Well, that was the same thing that happened when, uh, when Sandra McGuire did it with the audience side. They had several hundred people, even more than this, and that was the way most people got one or two, but that was all. Okay? Not very good performance. Now, what was the problem? I told you to count the vowels, but then I changed the problem, right? 
Now, now that you know what the question is really going to be, and I'm not going to change it this time, we're going to go back to that list. But before we do something, I want you to look at that list and see if you notice anything unusual or special about it. Take a look at that list. Do you see anything unusual or special about it? Well, you look like you got it. Do you understand what's special about it? Okay. You got it? Okay. Uh, what's special about it? Let me give you the microphone. Each one of them represents a number. Yes. Uh, and uh, from 1 to, well, the end, 14, 15. 1 to 15. 15. Yeah. Yeah. You see the number sequence association? Uh, a dollar bill, 1. A dice, uh, 2. A tricycle, 3. Four leaf clover, 4. Hand, 5. Fingers, 6 pack, 7. So forth, so forth. Okay? And they're in a sequence. Now that you know that information about the list, and now that you know what the question really is, I'm going to give you the same thing. 45 seconds, but this time I'm not going to trick you. So how many of these can you remember? So I'm going to give you 40 seconds, 5 seconds to remember it, and then I'm going to blank it out and see how many you can remember. Okay? Go ahead, 45 seconds. And write them down. Write them down. Actually, write them. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I just, I'm sorry. Don't write them down. I'm not now. Not now. I'm, 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 I'm undercutting my own problem here. Yeah, yeah. Just see if you can memorize them. Okay. Now see how many you can write down. I'm going to need more time this time, almost for sure. still writing. Do we need more time? Okay. Let's uh, see how many. How many got ten or more? Anybody get ten or more? Oh, look at that. Look at all the hands. Look at one of them. How many got, uh, say, six to ten? Okay, quite a few. I won't ask you how many got five or less, but uh, probably not so many, okay? But uh, let me pull that back up. Uh, your numbers were just about like the time she did it with that large group. That most people got three, four, or five, correct, in, that, in those categories, uh, which meant six or, six or more, okay? Uh, notice, how long do we take? About, what, ten minutes, maybe five minutes? And I raised your IQ by more than double. I didn't really raise your IQ, but what did I do? I increased your ability to solve an intellectual question or problem. Why is that little exercise, it's kind of a fun exercise, but why is that significant for us as teachers? Her, Sandra's point is the problems that freshman students have in learning chemistry is the same problem you had with that first time I asked you that question. They didn't know what we really want them to do. They thought we wanted them to memorize lots of things, whereas we wanted them to solve problems. And second, they didn't know there's a structure to chemistry. Once they know that's problem solving, not memorization, which they thought in high school, and there's a structure to chemistry, and if they understand what that structure is, they can, go, they can solve chemistry problems and learn chemistry way better than they could without those two changes in their attitude. What we have to do as teachers is change those two ideas of the students. Teach them that what the problems really are and what the kind of learning we want in higher education really is, and that, uh, that there's a structure to what we're trying to teach them for. And there's the, what the task really is, and there's structure to information. If you understand those two things, you can learn anything. Okay? 
she used that with her freshman class, what were the results? Well, then she tells them how to study and then they like learn things. But here's some data she had from some of her students. She, the, the numbers in black are the numbers that they scored on a, on a quiz, a 100-point test, before they took this study session. The ones in red are the numbers those same students scored after they did this study session. One hour. One hour. Got re he was flunking the course, and he got to be in the course. Uh, another student flunked the course and ended up with an A in the course. A third student had really passed the test and then really aced all the tests after that and got an A in the course. She changed those students' lives, not only in her chemistry course, but they learned how to be successful students in the whole college career. Without a doubt, all three of those students would probably have dropped out of college without learning about learning. And she did that as a teacher in one hour, okay? Changed their lives. We need to learn how to do the same things for our students. Now, I'm going to show you this other idea. I met this guy just shortly after I met Sandra McGuire. He's doing something similar with freshman students, but not the same kind of uh, teach them how to, you know, the right questions and so forth. He's doing something about self-directed learning, how to get ready students ready for that. And I'm going to show you a, an animated video that he put together on, uh, we can pull that up, showing what he's doing. So it's partly animated, partly him talking. You, you can pull that out and just go to the other thing if that's helpful. Yeah, there we go. If we make that large. Yeah, great. Hi. Yeah. This is Stephen Carroll. And Andrea Pappas from Santa Clara can University. Can we get the, can we get the, can we get the volume up? First day of class. This our students' bit. motivation and engagement and helps make them more self motivated in their approach to learning. Okay. The key is Just, to help uh, students think carefully about their goals and then to help them see a, how their existing can we get this, get, habits. Have we got that connected to speakers? We can hold it here, maybe. Hi. Where's our AB? Can we get this uh, sound connected to the speakers? Andrea Pappas from Santa Clara University. Uh, a little louder. Hi. This is Stephen Carroll. And Andrea Pappas from Santa Clara University. Our way of doing introductions in the first day of class increases our students' motivation and engagement and helps make them more self-motivated in their approach to learning. The key is to help students think carefully about their goals and then to help them see how their existing beliefs and habits around learning get in the way of their ability to achieve those goals. In our classes, it sounds like this. Hi, I'm Professor Pappas, and I'm a professor that you will remember. Whoa. This is important. To start this class, each of you is going to introduce yourself. You will have a lot of freedom to define yourself in college, so this will be your first piece of critical thinking. Who are you going to be in this class? Your introduction should be memorable and should help us get to know you. Your introduction can be up to 90 seconds long and should be based on the following questions. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are you going? And what do you want? You have five minutes to prepare your introduction, and remember, it should be memorable. Five minutes later, Professor Pappas introduces herself using the four questions. Then the students introduce themselves. We make it a point to visibly take notes as they do. Typically, students' introductions are remarkably unmemorable. When they're done, we give them a five-minute break. Now let's reflect. I'd like to push you a little on why you are here. Who will volunteer to say more about your answer? I'm here so I can get a good job. Billy? How does being here get you a good job? Well, it's not just being here. It's the degree that's going to land me that sweet job. How does that work? If I were to give you your diploma right now, how would I help you get this great job? Well, my resume will show that I'm a college graduate. That puts me ahead of people who haven't gone to college. Perhaps, but you are a first year student. You haven't really gone to college yet. How does a diploma alone make you a better person to hire than someone else? Perhaps someone who has more experience because they didn't go to college. Okay, so maybe it's not just having the degree. But by the time I graduate, I will be more qualified. Good. So what will make you more qualified? Is it just being here and hanging out that will make you a great employer? No, no. But I'll learn stuff along the way. Sounds good. What will you learn? I'll learn skills. You know, like in my major. Okay. 
But the guy who worked for four years was still going to college. Probably has some pretty good skills, too. Yeah, but I would have learned other stuff, too. Like principles and theories. He doesn't really know about the specific projects he worked on. I'll know a lot more. I, I would have learned other things in other classes, too. Uh, things that will help me do a better job, like how to do research. Uh, plus, I I'll be able to write well and to think critically. Aha! That sounds like a pretty good reason to be here. You're here to learn a discipline, but also to learn how to read and write and think critically. Those are the things that are going to help you get and keep that sweet job. So you need to spend the next four years focused on learning about your discipline and on learning to read, write, and think critically. How does this sound? Are those goals you're willing to work for? Well, you make it sound like a lot of work. But yeah, I guess that's kind of why I came to college. Go back to the PowerPoint. We repeat the process with three or four other students until they see the pattern. We don't stop asking questions until the student explains what they need to learn or how they're going to change by school. The night's homework assignment is to write up a revised self-introduction based on the four questions. The point of all this is to prompt students to explore more consciously why they're in college and to get them to commit publicly to their own goals for learning. We come back to each student's goals repeatedly throughout the course, especially when their behavior seems to contradict their stated goals. We ask them how what they're currently doing is supposed to support those goals, and then give them a chance to revise, either the goals or the behavior. This helps students see how their existing beliefs and habits often block them from reaching their educational objectives. It also helps motivate them to explore other forms of learning and helps make them more self-directed learners. Following this first reflection, we guide them through a second debrief, this time looking at how their unmemorable introductions did not follow instructions and how that undermined their ability to reach their goals. Okay. So what, what Steve and Carol is doing, and he does this, he works with students throughout the whole semester. Uh, keeps, you know, he teaches English, it's a freshman English course, but he's all constantly asking them, now, you're not showing up for class, you're not doing the homework, you're not doing the study things, you say you want to get a good education. How is that supporting that? And if it's not, you can either say, I don't want to get a good education, or you can change your behavior. What kinds of changes in our methods might be required? Let's see here. We finish up. Okay. Yeah. Let me just make sure we can go on here. Yeah. Uh, so basically, what he's doing is posing some really fundamental questions. What are you doing here? Who are you? What, why are you here? What do you want to get out of college and where are you going to go and all that? But then he keeps reminding, think about what you want to do in your behavior. What do you want to do in your behavior and making sure those are connected. And after a while, students get it. If I want X, I've got to do Y. And when that happens, they become self-directed people. And as a student, they become self-directed learners. So then I asked him, I said, okay, you've been doing this for a few years. Do you have any evidence that this is really making a difference in what students do in college after they leave your course. And he sent me a two-page, single-spaced letter with all kinds of fabulous, jaw-dropping stories. I can't share all that with you, but I'm going to share a few things with you. First thing was, was pretty impressive. They have a thing called the Dean's List, a list of the very good students at Santa Clara University. But they do it differently there. Most universities say if you earn a 3.6 or 3.7, you're on the Dean's List. Not at Santa Clara. At Santa Clara, to be on the Dean's List, you have to be in the top 10% whatever those grades are, top 10%. So if he's got students as freshmen, he would expect sophomore, junior, senior averages, 10% of his students will be on the dean's list. But when he kept track, what he found was, as juniors, 40% of them were on there, and as seniors, what, 45%. So they just kept getting better and better at directing their own learning effectively. Uh, elected, how many were elected to honor societies? Three times the rate of students in the general population. Same things in campus leadership positions, way overrepresented. But his general comment was that after he started doing that, the quality of the students' work in his class was dramatically better than what, he was, what it was before then. Same students, same range of abilities, but when he worked differently with them and got them focused on the important life questions and how to be good learners, self-written, those students became more motivated and more effective as learners. So the problem is not just in the 
the students. It's what we can do as leaders to motivate and enable students to learn. And what he did was pose some very fundamental questions that got them into thinking themselves as responsible for their own learning. A second tool we can do is help students put together learning portfolios. Um, there's a guy that this guy wrote a book about that that's now in its second edition, very popular book in the United States. And here's my little diagram, my Defink's best effort to put together a PowerPoint diagram that shows what we want students to do with learning portfolios. This is student time one and time two, beginning of a course, end of a course. All right? And we're teachers and we work with them throughout the course, we interact with them to help them learn about the subject matter of the course. And we want to do that and keep on doing that. But in addition to that, the other thing I think we want to do is get the students to stand back from their learning and look at themselves in the process of learning and start to ask questions. See the question mark up there? And after they ask some questions, what am I learning? How am I learning this? Etc. Etc. After a while they begin to see some patterns and the light bulb goes off. They begin to see this is how I learn best, this is not how I learn best. And as they get those insights, they start to become a meta learner. Someone who understands learning and understands themselves as a learner. Once that happens, they can take charge of their own learning and once that happens, Happens. They have a hammer where they can build their own learning and they can change what they know, they change their beliefs, the way they think, their performance, their values, etc. They can take charge, but to do that, they have to become aware of themselves as learners. And I think the learning portfolio helps them do that. After I learned how to do learning portfolios, I committed myself, I will never and never have taught a full length course without having students do learning portfolios because it just does so much to help them learn. Basically it can consist of a reflective essay, with, and that's the important part, and in the appendix you can put various things to support what you're doing, but the essay is the key part. And what I do, you can do whatever you want, but what I do is ask these four questions. What did you learn? How did you learn? What's the significance for you of what you learned? That is, where does it plug into your life? And finally, a really important part for me, show me your plan for near future learning. That is, what you can learn in the next one to three years to learn more about the subject of this course. Okay? Uh, if our university is going to be learning centered, the students have to learn all these things. They have to learn about metacognition, how to become self-directing learners, how to reflect regularly. Students do not know what you mean when you say reflect on your learning. So they're going to need some practice at that through the course so that when you get to the end of it, put together a learning portfolio, they'll know how to do that. Now, we got the professors doing good things, we got the students doing good things. The third piece is, I don't think the student, the teachers, los profesores, no los uh, estudiantes, can do the right things without proper support from the university. And that's the leaders and the administrators and the third out. What do the leaders have to do to help the professors and the estudiantes? Okay? Be good leaders. And that's, I've already shown you my definition of a good leader. The people, department chairs, uh, deans, provosts, rectors, all these people, they need to be good leaders. Motivating enables professors and students to do good things. Okay? Now, what are some of the things they can do? One general action I think is very important that at least the University, Catholic University of Uruguay, this university, has already done. Most, the vast majority of the University of the United States have not done this, but I think it's essential if you're going to be a learning-centered institution. You have to create campus-wide desired learning outcomes. What I mean by that is the university has to say, when we give a diploma to a student who graduates, and they want, do you have a ceremony for that? I assume most of you have a ceremony where you give out the certificates, right? The diplomas. When the rector of the university gives that, that diploma to the student, does he or she, the rector, know what that student can do? If the answer is no, you've got a problem. The university has a problem. They should know, not just that they passed courses, but they should know, can they communicate effectively? Can they solve problems? Can they work effectively in groups? Can they work effectively with people different from themselves, et cetera, whatever the university goals are? They should know the answer to that, and that means you've got to say, we want this kind of learning no matter what carrera you're in or what department you're in, all of you should know these things. This is a university graduate, and we're giving you a university, so that's the desired learning outcome. Here are some examples. The one university that really started this program way before anybody else did, they started it uh, 40 years ago. We didn't even know what they were doing. 
doing. I went to workshops there and barely understood what they were doing. But now I understand they were the, the best pioneers for the whole country. Those are a list of their campus-wide learning outcomes. It doesn't matter if you're majoring in engineering, art history, or geography, you have to learn those things. And you don't get a degree from Alverna College until you can show them that you have learned from a scale of one to six, a five or a six, on all eight of them. All eight of them. Okay? Uh, one medical school in the United States in Dayton, Ohio, has created some learning outcomes for all students, in, whether you're in surgery or pharmacy or nursing or whatever, you're in medical school. They use my taxonomy as a framework. Let me show you what, what they created. Uh, foundational knowledge, they laid some things out like that. Application, integration, learning about themselves as doctors or doctors to be. This is one of my favorites, learning how to interact with other people, patients, other medical care providers, etc. And caring, and finally learning how to learn. Okay, I said, "Wow! If they can succeed in, in in accomplishing that, all their students learn those, create the kind of curriculum, create the kind of teaching, do the kind of assessment as university to make sure that all of that happens for all their students. I think we're going to see new kinds of doctors in the United States, at least the ones that come through that medical school. But that's what a campus-wide learning outcome." can do for a university. Now this is just, they just happened in the last two years. They're starting to build rubrics for each one of those and they're moving along towards the curriculum on it. But then what you have to do is take the and say, okay, it's not enough to have the learning outcomes. You've got to map them into the curriculum and assess them. Okay? You've got to do both those. Otherwise, it's just pieces of words on a piece of paper doesn't mean anything. So you've got to make it happen, and you've got to know that it happens. And, uh, but if you do all of that, then you've done what you need to be a learning-centered institution. Now, uh, now, I'm going to ask specifically what the university leaders can do for professors. Uh, one is help the professors and encourage them to get better on that growth curve as teachers every year, every year. Now, how do they do that? What the leaders have to do, department chairs, deans, and so forth, is make sure the professors have the time and the opportunity to learn these new ideas. And that's what's happening in, in fac the universities that have faculty or educational development programs. That's what I did at Oklahoma. I ran a program that every week, every month, we had workshops and workshops, opportunities for professors to learn new ideas about teaching. Sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, more often in small groups, and more often not just a one-day workshop, but a every two weeks all year long kind of workshop where they got deeper and deeper in it. But that was my job. My belief is every university should have a program on campus whose only job is to provide those learning opportunities for professors. Now, when you're like Catholic University, you have lots of adjunct professors. One of the things you means is you have to find a time and a place to offer those opportunities that are possible for the adjunct professors, the part-time professors, because they have other jobs, so you just have to find that out. But the other problem is number two. You have to have the program, but you also, as a leaders, you have to send a message Learning new ideas is important. It's not optional. We cannot have a good program if our professors are not learning about and using good new ideas and better ideas about teaching. So this is not optional. We offer a workshop in learning. We don't just want to want 5% of our professors, though. We want all of them in there. Maybe not this week, but some week this month. And so how to motivate and send a message to professors, this is important. You have to find a way to do that. Let's look at that time. Uh, here, we'll see, I have a handout in fact development, didn't put that in here, but let's talk about that, send the message here. Do you do annual evaluations, professors? At the end of the year, do you evaluate professors here? Departments, does that happen? I'm, I'm, I don't know. Does that happen in Uruguay? Okay, it does in the United States, that's almost a, a, a widespread practice. End of every year, the chair or the dean evaluates professors say good job or bad job, teaching, research, and service, okay? I think you have to have a different focus for that. Let me show you what I think we should do on the first one. Right now, and I'm guessing you probably do this, in at least in most universities, at Oklahoma and most of the University of the United States, the, the, the big criteria when they evaluate faculty, was your teaching good? Did you do some research? Did you provide some service to the university or to, or to your discipline? Okay? And that's it. 
I call that the Holy Trinity. In a church, I feel it's okay to talk about the Holy Trinity, okay? Uh, I think we need to change that to the Holy Quadrilateral. <laughs> I'm changing the, 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 the religious service. I think we need to add a fourth, a fourth criteria, a major criteria. Yes, good teaching. Yes, good service. Yes, good research. In addition to that, did you do the kind of things you need to do to get better as a teacher? Did you spend time going to workshops? Did you change the way you teach? You can't get better if you don't learn ideas. You can't get better unless you change something. So tell me what you did to learn new ideas, tell me what you changed. Then I'll give you a good mark on professional development, okay? And then add that up, make sure it feeds into that. Okay, the other thing I think we can do is change the way we evaluate teaching. Now in the United States, what most universities do, they give a questionnaire to the students and say, do you like the course, did you learn something, whatever. But mainly, did you like it? Would you recommend it to a friend? Not a good, you need that information. You, know if the students, you need to know if the students are happy, but it's not a learning-centered way of evaluating teaching. Here was the way. Is that what you do in Uruguay? Questionnaires to students? That would you. Okay, same thing. So here's, here's how I would change that. It goes to my, back to my four fundamental tasks. But also, those are what teachers do. That doesn't tell you a good teacher or a bad teacher. What you also need to know is did that teaching have a good impact on student learning? During the course, were they engaged? By the end of the course, did they learn something? After the course, did they find value of it in their lives? In addition to that, I think we got to ask, did they get better over time? And they do that by acquiring new ideas, changing something, assessing effectiveness, reflecting on it, and that's a continuous cycle. So if we want to know if somebody did a good job, we need information about all of that. But that's too much. That's a loving moving parts. How do we simplify that? I would take four pieces out of that. Remember in the yellow circles, I said the two of them that were important, interact and course design, those are the big variables. I would collapse the blue and I would collapse the red and make four variables. Here's the way I would do it. First of all, I want to know, did they design their courses well? Second, did they interact with students well? Those are, both, those are important, but those are process. Third, learning-centered. Did important kinds of learning happen for a lot of students and not just the best 10%? And then finally, did they do what they need to do to improve their teaching from year to year? If a teacher can show me they did a good job on those four things, I don't care what else they did that's bad, I'm going to be happy. Because I know those are the things that are critical for good teaching. So I want them to show me that. So then what we have to do is those are our four criteria, and what we're going to need is four different kinds of information for each of those. Here's what I see in there. For course design, show me one or two of your course materials for one or two of your courses, some your syllabus and a few of your assignments. Interaction with students. Now, this is where we can use the questionnaire. Ask the students, was the teacher engaging, motivating, inclusive, fair, and etc. Whatever we want to know about good interaction. Student learning. Show me some samples of your student work. Work, medium work. I can tell them what the percentages are, and I can tell them for the high work what your criteria was and what the kind of learning was that you were really trying to promote. And then finally, getting better as a teacher, I just want the teacher to write a short essay, one page. Answer two questions. What did you do to learn about new ideas this year? Second, what did you do to change something you did as a teacher? Is it nickel dime or is it major? Okay. I get those four information, I create a rubric of one to five for each of those, I can add them up and say, good, good teacher, bad teacher, they're doing what I want, they're not doing what I want. But now notice the relationship between one, two, and three on the one hand, and number four. There's a real nice dynamic there. The teacher says, you want me to design my course well? I don't know how to do that. Nobody ever taught me that. What do you say as a department leader? No problema. Our educational development program has a workshop on that next month. Go learn how to design your courses better. Or they say, I don't know how to interact with students. They don't like me. No problema. Go to the workshop. Educational development, they have workshops on that, okay? I don't know how to assess student learning. No problema. Go to the workshop and take it, okay? You gotta have a program, give an option, and say, that's okay. But next year, I expect to see that by sector. Go to the workshop and get better at it. It focuses their learning. It tells them what they need to learn about. The big thing is not that they score 5-5-5, five, five, five. the big thing is they get on a growth curve. And the right kind of evaluation can get them to do that. And finally, you have lots of part-time professors in Uruguay and much of the world and some parts of the United States. They have special needs. This is a wild, radical idea. I haven't sold this to any university, but I still believe we need to do something with it. Here's what the needs for part-time professors are. Right now, 
They get paid for doing what? If they show up for class and turn in the grades, they get their paycheck, right? That's not a very good bar. Let's push them towards, towards better learning. What we really want to do is, of course, do that, but in addition to that, we want also for the part-time professors to spend time learning about teaching and teach as effectively as they can. How can we encourage them to do that? And what I'm going to suggest is change the way we pay them. And I got these out of order here, but I'm going to give it to you in the right order. Right now, what, what I think we should do is whatever that amount is that we pay them now, lower that just a little bit. Maybe keep it the same, but add on. But give them the base pay for showing up and turning in the grades. But in addition, we say we're going to give you a bonus if you attend so many hours of workshops during the coming year. And we'll try to make these available online or evenings or weekends. We'll make it easy for you to get them. But if you go to that, we'll pay you an extra thousand, what, pesos, reals, dollars? What do you say here? Uh, and if you can show evidence of good, good student learning, we'll pay you another thousand pesos, reals, or whatever. But the key is the new base pay with the bonuses must be more than the old base pay. You have to give them a motivation for spending time and documented quality student learning. Okay? And then you can, you're sending a message. If you just want to show up for class, you'll get paid, but not very much. But if you learn about teaching and show good learning, you're going to learn more than you're learning now. So it's worth your while. So if we can do that, I think it will help the part-time professors, which is a lot of the educational program here. Now, finally, students. Uh, help them become meta learners. Uh, one of the things we can do is fairly easily. When we have people that go out and recruit new students, right? And now they know all, all the students want to come like that. One student says, I want to get a good job. I want to get a degree so I can get a good job. What your person from university wants to do is say, that's okay. We're going to get you a degree so you can get that job. But in addition to that, we're going to wrap some additional things around you about application, about values, about learning how to learn and be a better person all your life in multiple ways. So you get your job and a whole lot more. Okay, so we got to send expectations. Come here and you're going to learn more than just get a, uh, get a good job. A lot of special programs have been started in the United States for first-year students. Okay, they're vulnerable students. They need help learning about learning if they're going to become a meta-learner. I think the universities need to have a special orientation program for students in their first year, first semester, first week on the campus that talks not about subject, not about dormitories, not about classes, how to be a good learner. Okay? Uh, the guy who's done the most of that is a guy named John Garshner. He just did a program, a survey around the United States, and here's what he found. There were some summer bridge programs before they come to the first semester. Uh, about 40, almost half of all institutions offer those, 12% participate, uh, moderate level of effectiveness. Uh, Pre-term orientation, I was talking about the week before classes start, get all your freshman students and talk about learning. Uh, two to four days, something like that, 85% of all institutions in the United States offer those a higher level of perceived effectiveness. But the more common thing now, and I was involved in this at Oklahoma, I taught some of these courses for a while, a, a first semester, excuse me, a first semester seminar that's not just about geography or history, but it's, it's about learning, being a student in the university, that lasts a whole semester, okay? And and a lot of universities, almost the vast majority of institutions now offer these, and even higher perceived effectiveness. Those are some of their goals for those things. So I would strongly recommend a seminar for a whole semester for students, first semester on campus, to learn about learning at the college level. A lot of payoff for that. Now, just a short one. Yeah, I've told you all the bad things about the University of Oklahoma. Here's one good thing they've done that I just discovered just about two months ago, uh, and it just opened this last fall. I was taking a visitor from Japan on the campus, and we discovered in the library there's some new spaces in the library that's for learning. Now, I didn't know anything about them. They were brand new. I'm going to show you some pictures of them, but students were using them day and night very effectively. Let me show you some pictures. It's called a collaborative learning center. It's set up so the students can work together on their learning for one class, for any class or whatever, okay? And here's what some of the spaces look like. This was a room, there's my friend from Japan. But they have a bunch of round tables. So the students just, they don't sign up for them. They just come in and use them as available. But each one of these tables has a... Uh, a computer modem, lots of different uh, places where they can plug their laptops into here, and then they can project them on these screens. So they can take something from any uh, any student's laptop and project it up there, and they can all talk about it. So I think these students were all in a class and working on a class 
project out of class on their own time in the library and this space made it very easy for them to do that. The other thing that they had a lot of was these little portable whiteboards. Just like uh, that whiteboard over on the side there except it's smaller and it's just sitting on a piece of thing and students can move it wherever. So you often get one or two students working out a problem, trying to diagram it, trying to design it, trying to look out possibilities. That's what these two, uh, two students were doing there, working on it. They had a big more open space where they have meeting tables, uh, uh, a little, another portable whiteboard next to them. These students weren't using that. But a place for students to work together on learning, collaborative learning center. And I was, and well, the other thing that they made to just to make it enjoyable for students, they had a Starbucks. Good coffee, good desserts, get a sandwich in the library. Imagine that, okay? Uh, so students enjoyed going to this place. And we went over there on a, in the middle of the week afternoon and it was packed with students. I don't think there were, there were not many empty seats in that whole space. Wonderful idea. Help the students learn how to work together and learn. And that's especially important here where your students come and go, okay? Getting them to stay on campus and work on learning with a space like this could be very, very helpful. Okay, there you go. Okay, let's wrap it up. Uh, what the, so it, it starts with the leaders. I talked about professors too, but it really starts with leaders. What can they do? If they can create, give a focus to everybody's efforts, the professors and students, by creating these campus-wide desired learning outcomes, and then for the professors, have a teaching learning center where the professors can learn about teaching every year, every year, encourage them to get those ideas and do some special help for part-time professors. For the students, help them take responsibility for their own learning by sending different recruiting messages, special programs for first-year students and have some special learning places around the campus someplace. If you can, then what the professors can do is design their courses in a better way, interact with students in a better way, and get themselves on a growth curve. Every year, every year, get better, better, better. Can you imagine where they would end up 15 years from now? Okay? And the students can see them themselves in a new role, not just receiving information, but generating my own learning. Think about that. Students taking responsibility. I'm the one that has to create the learning, not the professor, and I know how to do it. And they, de they develop a better understanding of themselves, become effective meta-learners, and so forth. If you can get that to happen, with the leaders providing the support and the encouragement, professors do their part, students do their part. Imagine what's going to happen. I'm using, I'm talking to UCU here, but it's for every other institution that's represented here. Even the military academy, I tell you, the military places can uh, do good things, I hope, with this. But you're going to be able to increase your reputation. The word is going to get out. Students go here and good things happen. Reputation is going to go up. You're going to be able to compete more effectively for good students, good professors, money, requests for support, etc., etc. And you're going to get, you're going to be a learning center at the university, and you're going to be on a growth curve. Okay? If you can do that, what are the big benefits? First of all, to your students. Your students will leave your university more knowledgeable, more capable, ready for their personal life, social life, civic life, and professional life. If they can, students come out better, that's going to help society. We're living in a very complex age because it's more connected, the problems are more complex. Society needs people coming out of higher education who know how to interact with other people, who know how to solve complex problems, who know how to learn new stuff for those complex problems. If we don't solve that problem, our society is going to have problems. We're going to have environmental problems. We're going to have terrorist problems. We're going to have economic problems, etc., etc. Until we learn how to do that, and that's our job, provide people who can do that. Your institution is going to be the beneficiary. You're going to get a good reputation, better students, more money, etc. And you're going to be happy whether you're a leader or a professor. Your job is going to be more enjoyable because you're going to see more students responding, engaging, learning, and you see what kind of effect that has on professors when they do that. The leaders are going to see the institution become more effective, more successful. Everybody at the institution is going to be happy. This is going to be a wonderful world, okay? Uh, and what's going to happen is wherever you are now, Instead of doing that, you're going to get yourself on a growth curve. The institution is going to have a better educational program five years, ten years, twenty years from now. Your grade is going to be better. The world is going to be better. A good thing to feel a part of, and you'll be part of it. And that's the end, except, no, it's really not. It's just a new start. Okay? Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your comment. Uh, and your patience. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Now, we do have some time for some questions and so forth. Uh, and I'm gonna, we're going to pass the uh, microphone around here and they can translate for me. So if you want to say it in Spanish, that's okay. Uh, questions about all of this? Is, is, is it just a big dream? It is a big dream, but I was trying to show you it really can happen for people. So, but how to make it happen? Questions? Let's explore it a little further. Yeah. Muchas gracias, primero que nada, por su brillante disertación. Eh, yo entendí todo lo que creo que lo que usted comunicó en cuanto a, a las funciones nuestras como docente. Ahora, al igual que nosotros, que somos seres biológicos y sociales, también lo son los estudiantes. Y no, yo no creo que todos los estudiantes tengan la capacidad de haber elegido bien la carrera, ¿verdad? O... De, de, de poder llegar a cumplir las metas que se, que se fija, que se fije, como decía usted, en matemática, en biología. O, es decir, me gustaría saber cómo reorienta usted a sus estudiantes cuando, porque pienso que muchas veces podemos diagnosticar que no tienen la capacidad suficiente. Es decir, la capacidad suficiente para esa carrera o que tienen... Como les decía, ser biológico y social que tiene que tener determinado, puede tener determinados problemas para no avanzar, no poder avanzar como algo real. Entonces me gustaría saber, ¿verdad? Okay. So, sir? Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, your, your concern is that sometimes students go into a course or a major that they're not ready for. Is that correct? Okay. That's a, a really important problem. Yo soy docente de odontología, por ejemplo. Say again? Yo soy docente de odontología. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 yeah. Ah, de odontología. Y en eso, muchas veces... Yeah. Yeah, okay. no problem. Yeah, same is true in all subjects, though. Geography, history, all of them. Yeah, same is true. But uh, what I think we get, and it's a valid point, sometimes uh, students choose a major that really is not a good choice for them. They had a friend, their father, uh, it looks like it makes a lot of money, whatever. What I think we should do in each of our careers is have a diagnostic information. If we know what it takes in terms of prior knowledge and interests and values to be successful in this carrera, we should examine students and say, you can continue if you want, but we don't recommend it. There's a high chance you're not the right person for this. Maybe a different career, but not this one. Or the same thing in a course. You know, we do that in the United States a lot, especially for mathematics. That's a whole ladder. So where should the students start? Here or here or here? Are they ready for Sometimes they're ready for here. But we give them a test to make sure they're in the right course at the right time. So my basic answer is we need to learn how to give diagnostic tests and and diagnostic feedback to students, right, court, right time for the course, right choice for the career. So just to help them out, like that. make them improve their choices. Yeah. So thank you. Other questions? Otros preguntas. Okay. Let's here. Yeah. Hey, antes de que se retiren, vamos, el doctor, el doctor Fink ha traído tres copias de su libro para sortear entre los participantes acreditados, así que le pedimos que esperen unos segunditos a terminar con las preguntas y luego los sorteamos, ¿sí? Yeah. Yeah. We'll take maybe two more questions and then, uh, then we'll do the, do the free books. More questions? Now we told you free books, we don't want to work quick. I'm going to get the free book here. <laughs> Yeah. Any more? Any more questions? Okay, we won't press you too much further. You've been here in the hot room, so let's uh, let's wrap it up. But thank you very much for being good listeners, and we'll we'll give the books away here. Bueno, agradecemos la presencia. Thank you. Asuntos públicos para conocer mejor, para saber más.